Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, about uh, six or eight months ago, I joined Innovate UK as the Director for Health and Life Sciences. Uh, having not known too much about what Innovate UK actually did in the process of finding out, I was keen to look at new models to how we grow uh, both economic growth within the health and life sciences, but also look at how we invest in life science companies to try and help them scale and grow. Uh, having been on the other side of the fence and run some small biotech companies uh, as CEO looking to, uh, to fund them, the challenge is always to get the max funding, to grow the company, to allow the CEO to look at the strategy for the business rather than always seek funding. So that's what we've been tempted to do over the last six or seven months to try and change how we fund businesses through Innovate UK and the health and life sciences space. I think this slide can be looked upon as two different uh, elements. It's either a tragedy or an opportunity because the world population is growing. Uh, one in three babies born in the UK today should live to be 100. We're going to require 6% more food and healthcare spend is rising faster than GDP. So all of those are challenges that we have to face. Uh, and the reality is that we have to do uh, improvements to medicine, to diagnosing, looking at cures rather than, than just chronic treatment. And we also have to feed the population better as well within uh, Innovate UK. Food and nutrition are also part of the health and life sciences space. Innovation is disruptive. Uh, and the example, as we all know, <coughs> is the iPhone. I can remember when I was growing up, it took six weeks to get a landline put into your home. And now we can go into a phone shop and within 10 minutes we can access the web, we can create banking, we can check the weather, we can order uh, from Amazon. So we need to think more in the healthcare space about what true disruption is rather than just incremental gains because that's clearly what's going to have to transform if we're going to address the challenges that are presented in the previous slide. Those of you that don't know Innovate UK, we are the government's funding agency in innovation. We are an arm's length government body sponsored by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, which we'll touch on later. And our key role is to look at economic growth by providing new jobs through high skilled employment, by developing new technologies and exporting that uh, on a globally uh, competitive basis. We've been going for 10 years. So we've invested £2.2 .2 billion pounds of taxpayers' money, and we return about £7.30 for every pound we've invested. More importantly, we also leverage private money. So of that £2.2 .2 billion, it's been added by about £1.5 billion of, of, of uh, private money at the same time. And that's helped to create around about 70,000 jobs over the past 10 years. Obviously, our mandate keeps changing. Technologies keep being transitioned round, and therefore our game is to, is to try and see the next thing, invest in it early to help it to get traction, so that ultimately it can be taken on by private investment and companies to, to grow the next generation of products. We've got four different divisions, health and life sciences, which is mine, but also emerging and enabling technologies, manufacturing materials, and infrastructure systems. One of the common questions that we get is, we don't know where to go to apply to Innovate UK, we don't quite fit any of your boxes. So we also have an open program for those of you that have a technology that may apply to more than one of these areas. So if you're uncertain about where to apply, yes, look at the focused area in health and life sciences, but also think about, is it a material, is it a new manufacturing method, or indeed is it an open <coughs> program that will transgress all the sectors and therefore be something that you should look more broadly to be uh, funded. So this, this is a slide that sometimes raises some eyebrows. If I'm speaking in the north, they don't like it quite so much as I do in the south. But actually, if you break it down, by percentage of population, our spend on health and life sciences is broadly equivalent across the UK. Yes, there's a bias down to the southeast, but there are more uni universities, there are more spin-out companies, there are more people. So therefore, we do tend to invest a lot of our money in the southeast, but I think that's just reflective of the, both the population, the academic base, and the number of ideas and spin outs that are in that area. <coughs> we don't work alone. We work in partnership with government agencies, with the NHS, with the regional devolved governments, and with the research councils. And clearly going forward, one of the keys for us is to integrate into UK research and innovation, which is an amalgamation of all the research councils in Innovate UK into one body. That will happen in April of next year, and hopefully that will give us a coordinated strategy for translating academic research 
and to business opportunity through a long-term investment in a strategic manner. This is where I have to confess and say that originally I was supposed to be on the advanced therapy slide uh, side of, the, of the, the presentations. It doesn't matter about the figures, we apply both to precision medicine uh, diagnostics and advanced therapies in a similar way. We run competitive competitions where business and academia can apply and innovate UK in collaboration to translate their findings into something that evolves and grows. Advanced therapies is one example of that, where we have invested about 62 million pounds over the last uh, 10 years or so. We've had some private money, and that's funded about 130 projects, and is beginning to yield uh, a whole new industry on cell and gene therapy that hopefully will remain in the UK. One of our challenges, if you look at monoclonal antibodies, were invented in the UK, scaled up in the UK, acquired into the US, and all those jobs went with it. We want to have a high-skilled workforce, so therefore what we're doing is investing in manufacturing as well as research and development to drive the infrastructure <coughs> in the UK to be more successful for the longer term. So with cell and gene therapy, we are going to uh, build, or we have built, we are going to open a manufacturing centre in cell and gene therapy in Stevenage, hopefully at the end of this month. All of our funded companies need partnerships. We know that if we have businesses that collaborate, either with academia or with other businesses, the projects tend to yield more than just individual businesses on their own. And I think there's a simple reason for that. Within one company, there's not all the ideas, so you need to tap into different skills and resources. So collaborative projects are looked on more favorably by Innovate UK because they return more value back to the economy, but also help us to develop <coughs> new and more exciting companies based on developed technologies going forward. We get involved in companies either very early in, in the cycle through to TRL <coughs> 5 and 6. If we look at somewhere like Cell Medica, we get involved when they were only four employees, gave them a, a relatively modest grant to help them to initiate some clinical trials, and the basis of that was secured £110 million in full run funding and grown from four to 70 people. Now that in itself might not seem a lot, but when you think that technology could have been lost because they were scrambling around for funding at that time, that shows you that that patient capital that VCs won't invest early on in projects has to come from somewhere. So we see our roles take risks by investing in earlier projects and trying to drive them into something that will be successful for the longer term. <coughs> Similar story with uh, Oxford Biomedica, where we've given them a variety of awards through the Biomedical Catalyst to help with the clinical trials for gene therapy developments in both Parkinson's and corneal graft rejection. They've just signed a £90 million deal with Novartis and have five or six other deals on the back of that. Again, we got involved early when no uh, private funding was available to them, helped them scale up and now see them being successful and remain located in the Oxford area. Biomedical Catalyst is probably the most well-known programme that we run in this space. And it's unique. it's unique in two ways. We run it as a collaboration with the MRC, and we're also able to combine academic projects and business projects together. We've leveraged about £240 million of investment over the past six years or so. That's been also mined up to £120 million of private funding. At the same time uh, as doing that, we're able to grow and scale these businesses to be really quite successful in a relatively short period of time, given that in our sector, we're high risk. It takes 10 to 15 years to get a product to market. So success in this space is about growing the companies, allowing them to get access to the right skills, tools, and processes to allow them to scale. And the Chancellor announced in the autumn statement last year that he was going to extend this project for another four years with another 100 million pounds worth of funding. So clearly, uh, we must be doing something right in this project. We're also aware that innovation, if you've got a name like Innovate UK, we have to be innovative, and we have to find new ways of working. Um, Nigel uh, talked earlier about the value of debt <coughs> that maybe didn't exist. I think for some of us that have been CEOs and tried to raise money, we're aware there is a value, whether it's of debt or not, I'm not quite sure, but it's certainly demanding to raise funding. So what we've tried to do uh, in recent times is look at how we introduce private capital into companies much earlier. One of the ways in which we've done this is back <coughs> off we announced on May the 9th, where we work with seven VCs and a consortium, where we will fund the project, 
and they will fund the company. So essentially, you'll make a standard application in Innovate UK. If the quality threshold is met when it's assessed independently, then we will approve the project for funding. The applicant also checks a box to decide which one of the seven VCs is likely to fund alongside or they would like to be involved with. If they like the management, the IP, and the prospects for the company, then together they get 100% of the funding to allow that business to grow and scale. The reason for choosing the seven VCs mentioned here is the fact that over the past five years, they've invested about a billion pounds in Innovate UK funded companies. So therefore, we think there's a synergy between what we do and what they like to see. Also, it shows that if we can get good, strong applications through the Innovate UK process, your chances of funding are much greater going forward. And by introducing the VC earlier, if the company undertakes the project, reaches the milestones, gives a successful outcome for that initial investment, we're hopeful that the VCs will follow on for the longer term. So a way of trying to accelerate the development of companies and the introduction of private capital. <coughs> Innovate UK is more than just funding though. Uh, the question I get asked the most is can we get more money? And sometimes the answer is yes and no. But also the KTN is there to fund and connect businesses together to allow you to succeed and grow. Use the KTN to review your applications, get them prepared earlier. If the KTN reviews your applications into Innovate UK, you're 30% more likely to be funded. In the interest of time, I'm going to leave it there. If you have any questions for me, I'll be around for the next few hours. If there's anything pressing, I'll take it now. Thank you.